climate, so that all helps. It, uh, our winters are normally not too severe. Um, we'll get several days below zero, but it won't. It won't be brutally cold for extended periods of time normally, and, and usually dry winters. So it's it was it's good commercial cattle feeding country. There's several hundred thousand head in commercial yards within a half hour, forty five minutes of my house. So it's uh, okay. It's, it's good good cattle feeding country. Yeah, and uh, I know there's a lot of good cattle that come out of Nebraska, and uh, you know there's there's this. Uh, you know, you guys are kind of on, uh, like, Nebraska and Iowa is kind of a whole different deal than, um, you know, like the, the Southern Plains, Kansas, uh, Texas, Oklahoma area. Um, I, I just, I, I'm not real familiar with uh, with your part of the world. Like, I know a lot of people from that part of the world, but as far as kind of how the, the feedlot, you know, the supply chain is, is set up there, it's kind of, it's a, a little different than what I'm used to, I think. But, I, you know, it's all, it's all feedlots. I mean, you know, it's it's all cows and and calves and you know and it's uh but just i guess how it gets uh it goes around a little different you know it's but I, anyhow we're we're uh we're live now we got a couple people watching and uh you know um i got today i've got on the bottom you'll see dustin berggraf uh and you're you're uh you're in nebraska but you're are you from north dakota or no, I, I'm in very northern South Dakota, north central South Dakota. South Dakota, okay, that that's yes, right. Yes, sir. So yeah. I, uh, I I knew I was somewhere uh, somewhere up there, farther north than me, but, um, <laughs> uh, and then I've got John O'Day from Nebraska up on top there, and uh, yeah, we're um, we're all in the the stockmanship and ranch roping uh facebook group which it's a really good group uh i i uh i like to go there and i don't i don't comment a whole lot of i share posts in there every now and then but i, I like to just troll through the comments because you can really learn a lot of cool shit in there and uh but we uh i don't it may have been you john that made the post uh, i don't know but it, it had a had a whole bunch of comments and it was basically kind of uh, a discussion the, the kind of the ongoing discussion in the cattle industry, you know, mandatory country of origin labeling, uh, packer control and manipulation, which I, I 100% uh, percent, uh, percent, uh, got, can't talk tonight. It's a uh, it's Cinco de Mayo. So maybe I've had a few sue me, whatever. Um, but, uh, yo, know, it's, it's, um, I 100% believe there is some some packer uh, manipulation in the market. They do have uh, way too much control. It's uh, there's not enough competition. All of that being said, I I, I I stopped short of throwing any full support behind a government mandate just because the the government can and will has been known to been proven over and over and over. Uh, to be inept and incompetent and could fuck up a wet dream. So that's where I uh, I fall short of throwing any support behind the the government mandates, whether it's the 3014 uh, proposal or mandatory country of origin labeling. I I truly believe that the the market is changing before us, and we have far too many cattle producers that either are unwilling or don't know how to change to adapt to that market and um and then having only four uh big packers control 80 percent of the the beef supply doesn't help our cause either so it's it's a challenging market but i, I think uh too many uh fingers are being pointed at the packer and not enough uh looking inward as to how you can adapt and uh, so that's that's kind of what i wanted to talk about tonight uh uh, and everything's fair game throw to throw ideas out there and or just you know it's it's just a discussion so i guess um dustin i'll start with you um what is your uh kind of what's your thoughts on the market today well i mean it, it sucks there's no doubt about it um i i i want to take the devil's advocate side now i'll preface this by saying this is only my opinions of what's going on i guess and on where we're at but but 
I'm not necessarily opposed to like a cool type thing, but anything government mandated, I, I'm not, I'm not on board with it. Um, as farmers and ranchers, I guess we, we really pride our independence. Um, we pride, you know, our, our individuality, my operations different than, than yours is different than yours is different than yours. And, and, and the beauty of that is, is there is a lot of different markets out there that we can, we can find, we can create, we can, we can fit our cattle into and, and, uh, I'm a firm believer that, that with the way things are right now, some guys are probably going to go out of business or going to go bankrupt, but it's not because of right now. Um, it, it, it's, it's tough. Don't get me wrong, but, but I really think that it, if you're going to blame what's going on right now on into going out of business, um, I think you need to, to really look at your management or your, your, your way of doing things and, and really reconsider. Did I, did I look at some of these other options? Was I too, was I too opposed to change to do anything? Yeah, I think, I think that's a, yeah, I, very well said. I, I, I agree with pretty well a hundred percent of that. Uh, so John, what's, what's your thoughts? We'll uh, give, give you a chance for uh, agree or rebuttal or somewhere in the middle. And then we'll, uh, then we'll just go kind of round table. I, I agree with a lot of what Dustin said. I'm not, I, I have been a member of RCAF in the past. I've been a member of the NCBA in the past, in the last 25 years. And I, at one time I was a staunch believer in mandatory country of origin labeling. And anymore, I've kind of adapted to the idea that it doesn't really have the economic merit that everybody thinks it's going to be. I mean, every, everyone has this idea that it's just going to be this uh, this golden parachute, and it's just not going to be there. Um, I'm in a pretty unique position because we have a catering business, and we sell a lot of beef direct. And you can talk to it. In our area, it's pretty rural. It's a pretty delicate balancing act in getting your beef profitable, getting your catering business profitable, but not pricing yourself out of the market. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, we don't have to push ground beef very much higher. And that's what a lot of people say. Oh, if we shut off the lean trim, if we did this, then our calls would be worth more and our select cattle would be worth more. I'm sorry. There's a lot of cattle. Me personally, it's pretty offensive to think that uh, that cull cows should be worth as much in the beef as select beef, and that select beef should be cho closer to choice beef. Um, but that's all you would do. What you would do is with a mandatory program, if we shut off all imports, you pull the top down and you push the bottom up, and we'd probably be having about the same kind of net profits as what we've ever had but we'd shorten up our consumption. That's what it looks like to me. Um, and I think I, I'm going to say this right now, and it's probably going to piss some people off, but the ranching community has a real big entitlement problem. Yeah. We, there are a tremendous amount of people that think that they're entitled because grandpa did it and grandpa paid his dues. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, every generation has got to make their changes and got to adapt. Grandpa used the best technology he had available to him and used the best genetics he had available and made the best decisions he could so that the next generation, the next generation. Um, I'm a fifth generation, but I started out this business with a negative net worth when my wife and I got married and have tried to build something over the last 20 plus years. Um, and so... Uh, I mean, I was the youngest of six kids. There, there wasn't a ranch to inherit. There was ranch payments to inherit. <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not going against what my folks tried to do. I know I realize what they're trying to do. They gave me a chance. They gave me an opportunity to buy a ranch. And nobody else would give me that opportunity. But it, it's been tough. And so I really... It's pretty easy for me to get jaded and bitter when I hear some of these guys that are that are on grandpa's or great grandpa's place 
pissing the motor and how the nurse cows raise whole steam bucket calves. I still carry 75, 80, five gallon buckets every day feeding light calves and, and small pens of cattle. And, and I mean, we do a lot of the ugly stuff that the, that the cool kids refuse to do. And, and we're building a business. And I mean, there's plenty of opportunities out there to, to take advantage of premium programs. There's, there's, there's a world of opportunities out there to help you get through tough times like this. And if you've worn the harness of tradition and are gonna pull that tradition wagon all the way through, there's probably gonna be some times when it's probably not gonna work. And, and it's, uh, you know, already, I'm not saying, I mean, 2015, early 2016, really crippled us financially. Um, we're still recovering from that. We had a lot of cattle on feed commercially and, and uh, had built up our cow herd numbers and, and everything. And so it was, it was a tough, tough time for us. And uh, we went back to what, what built our deal up to that point. And, and I think that's, we're, we're going back to an old adage, an old cattle feeder told me 25 years ago, he said, try and do twice as good with half as many. And so that's, that's what we've done is, is trying to, to make everything value added when it leaves our place. Yeah. And our model is different from other people's models. You know, you're, there's, there's opportunities out there for everybody to add value in some way, way shape, or form to their cattle. Well, and I, I think there's a there's a lot of truth and merit to what you were saying. Um, you know, I, I think there is a little bit of a, an entitlement uh, issue within the the ranching and the cowboy community, um, and and there's also a big disconnect issue uh, with the consumers, and that that drives a lot of you know why we raise our cattle the way we do. You know, we we want we want faster growing calves because there's a, obviously a high demand for beef. Uh, but we also want them good marbling because people like uh, grain finished, uh, you know, well marbled beef, you know, even though uh, grass fed and lean is kind of the, the niche deal now. Uh, I don't see that taken off because uh, grass fed's a whole different flavor. Um, but yeah, you know, we, well, we don't, we don't do it. We can't afford grass fed. We can't afford grass fed to take off. Because the third world countries that pay zero land tax will bury us in product. Yep. Uh, well, it, it's happening already. Most of the grass fed is imported beef. You know, they have a cost advantage that, that we don't want to play in that, in that field. Yeah. In, in America, I mean, we can do what we want. We're, we're free to do what we want. And at least where I'm at, and, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas areas, I, I don't see the organic, I don't see the grass fed thing really panning out. But if no. you get over to other parts of the country, you know, you get over into, I've been in Virginia and West Virginia, North Carolina, where there is small farms where, where you know, it's kind of a side gig, then, then grass fed and, and organic type things, they can work for them and they can do a good job at them and there's a market for it. Yeah. But this pushing, this pushing you, me, and everybody else to, to fit into a mold, that's never going to work. I mean, I mean, that's one of the beauties and one of the huge, you know, demons that haunt us as, as beef producers is we're not, none of us the same. The cattle that work for me up here in northern South Dakota don't work for a guy in Oklahoma or Texas. No, not at all. And, um, and you know, I guess one of the, I've said it on a, a previous podcast, it was kind of a, you know, a little bit of an unpopular opinion, but as good of a job that certified Angus beef or, you know, the Angus association did at, at pushing certified Angus beef, you know, it, it changed the entire market, but it also helped box us into where we are now because initially selling on the grid, it was premiums to, to hit the, those programs. And now it's it's more more than a, a premium. It's just you just get docked if you don't hit those programs. And so you, everybody is pushing to to reach this the same like you said the same little box. But that doesn't work. You know, Florida cattle are not going to do well up in uh, the the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, 
you know, unless in, it's in the summer, but you know, you know, stalker calves, but you're, you're not going to run a cow calf herd of uh, zebu crosses in, uh, in the Sierra Nevadas. It's just, it doesn't work, but you're still trying to hit that upper third, two thirds of choice and uh 51% black hide and all that good stuff to hit that, that premium. And, um, and it's, it's, it's kind of like everything in life, you know, a, a, a one size fits all solution doesn't work because the one size doesn't fit all. And, uh, and I'll go ahead. Go, I, I just, uh, are we all trying to hit them premiums? I, I mean, I guess I would ask, I'll be honest. I've been waiting for 15 years for something like this. I work for a large producer. I manage a, I manage a ranch for him and, and I've been trying to set myself up for an opportunity like this where guys would be looking for a way to get out. Um, I'm not asking for a handout, but if I can get in on a large enough scale to support myself and my family, um, um, I'm telling you, it's, it's what I've been waiting for, honestly. Yeah. And, and, and I'm seriously looking, can I keep my job here and, and continue, you know, our, our, our calving rotation, our what we're producing here, and also do my own thing. And I'm telling you, it looks like to me that the thing to do would be to produce, you know, not the high quality beef. And, and I hate that term. I mean, it's, it's different quality. We're going into a different market. We're managing different. And can I do that and, and be successful at it by not having, you know, I realize that your, your grass, um, lease payment, whatever is probably going to be the same, no matter what type of beef you're producing, but, but your, your time investment is worth something too. And yeah. can I calve in May and June and run cows on corn stalks all winter long and, and still be profitable at it in, in what the math on my computer says is absolutely. And, and that's a whole different market that I'm looking at going in than what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and well, it's it's ideas like that is what's going to pull us out of this hole that we've dug ourselves in, because you know over the years, like you know, I guess the point I was making at is you know, and it has has a lot to do with the Packer consolidation, but a lot of that a lot of that stuff is not as it's due to poor management from smaller Packers or just excellent management from like uh, if you read the the story of John Tyson and how he started in the, the poultry business, uh, dude worked his fucking ass off to, uh, to, to buy a, a, a chicken slaughterhouse. And then he was like, you know, the, the whole vertical integration thing, it's, uh, it gets demonized a lot. And I, I, I can see where it is bad for an industry, but a lot of that, like there, there's never, they always talk about the chickenization you know, of, of whatever industry, you know, it was a hogs and now they're talking about it, a beef and I can see how it's a bad thing, but they, you never hear them say, well, what did the chicken farmer do wrong to, to let himself get chickenized? And, and there, there was just a lot of terrible mismanagement and a lot of, uh, a lot of government interference, you know, like whether it be with banks or with the EPA and, everything else and and this is what happens every time you ask the government to step in and do something and uh you know it i i don't know i i asked a good friend of mine on this 3014 uh deal that corbett wall has been proposing and uh if you guys have been listening for a while you you probably heard about it but anyway the proposal is for every major facility packing facility in the in the u.s uh mandatory has to buy 30 percent of their cattle uh killed uh as a negotiated cash settlement so they have to go out and bid on cattle and they have to deliver them or have to pick them up in a 14-day window um and they, they want that mandated uh enforced i guess by the mandatory price reporting but i've never heard anything about like what's the penalty if you don't like do they make you buy go buy more cattle if you don't hit that percentage or do they fine you or do they not let you uh buy any more formula cattle i i don't know like you know there's no specifics on that end uh or at least i haven't heard any 
Um, but I, I just, there, there's so many loopholes around that. So like, do they have to have a certain percentage of, of beef cattle versus dairy cattle? So, cause a guy could, you know, a packer could go, you know, I don't know how many of them are killing 30% Holsteins, but they can go buy a shitload of Holsteins at, at the sale barn or whatever, you know, and make, make a deal that way. And, uh, and that drives down the weighted average drives down the, the price of the formula contract. And, uh, and this was, you know, making a problem that, that's that we have even worse by having the government step in, you know, it's, uh, there, there's ways around that deal. And, um, I, I just, I don't know. I, 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 I hate to go against like, you know, a lot of, a lot of my, my friends and family on, on this kind of deal, but like, I, I just, I'm not convinced it more than anything is like, I, I just, I, I want to be convinced on it and nobody has brought, has, uh, has really answered any of those good questions. So I, I just keep thinking like, you have to look at what can I do to, like you said, to add value to your cattle, to, to add value to your product. How, how can I cut a penny here? that's not going to cut value there. Um, you know, my, <laughs> my, my feeling on the 30, while you're talking about the 3014, my feeling on the only thing that the 3014 will accomplish is it will depress feeder cattle prices because it will make feeders. It will make, there's going to have to be so more risk assumed by certain cattle feeding entities. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to bid less for the cattle to offset the risk. That's the whole reason. I mean, that's the whole risk management is the big thing. And it's going to cost them, if they can contract fewer cattle, it's going to mean that the feeding company is going to assume more risk. And so there's going to be more costs incurred in managing that risk for them. Yep. These, these multi-billion dollar money holding companies didn't get into the cattle feeding business to lose money. They got in it to make two or three percent twice a year off of money that they're paying somebody else one percent for. Yeah. Plain and simple. That's that that's their program. That's why cactus has has been sold to a separate entity aside from the packing house. That's why Five Rivers is no longer technically part of JBS. And and if I mean those are the two examples that I can think of right off the top of my head that it would it would be there's going to be gaps where they're going to say, well, you know what, we can't, we're going to have to give two or three dollars a hundred less for these feeder cattle because we've got more, more hedging. We're going to have to be more aggressive with our hedging program. And I, I, I don't see it being a positive game changer for us like everybody thinks it's going to be. And, and already in the state of Nebraska, over 30% here in the Northern Plains, over 30% of the cattle are already cash. Yeah, it's it's really a southern plains issue. It's a it's a really and um, we've bitched up here in the country north of I seventy for twenty five years that the good cattle up here were dragging the southern cattle up. I mean they're and it's and it's a proven fact the cattle that are fed in Nebraska have higher percentage of choices, higher percentage of primes. And, but there's so many times that the cash market's established by a few cattle that were bought, select or low yielding cattle that were bought out of a southern yard. And I mean, yeah. so I don't, there's a reason why those southern yards are the kind of cattle they feed predominantly. They've got to be contract cattle, got to be tight margin cattle. And these guys in the Northern Plains feed better cattle and will go on a cash basis to try and, and, uh, and get some cattle sold high from a quality standpoint. Mm. I, I do have a question for you, John, though. And, and this this goes back to my whole, I, I, I guess it's just maybe I'm mixed up, but why, why are Northern cattle better and not just different? Why can't we find markets for the Southern cattle? I mean, cattle are different and there's a whole bunch of different markets. How are they better, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, and, and you know what? You're right, Dustin. Better might not be the – predominantly, the, they're, a, they're a higher – the quality grade is better is the reason I was saying the cattle were better. Right, 
Right. And yeah. you're you're right. There's a huge number of those southern those southern fed cattle that are, you know, pens that are fifty or sixty percent select instead of being sixty or seventy percent choice. You know, they're more select cattle. And I think a lot of those go into the the institutional market, goes into the lower end supermarket market and your chain restaurants I like Applebee's think, and and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. They're and and a lot of I mean Walmart was really thought they were doing something when they started selling choice beef. Yeah. You know, 90, up until a couple yeah. of years ago, 90% of the beef in, in uh, grocery stores are select. And, and you've really got to, as a consumer, you've got to be careful to mm -hmm. know whether you're getting, I mean, most of them don't know whether they're getting select or choice, the vast majority. And they don't know the difference between the two grades. And, yeah. and I don't think there's ever been a push because they could market, they could sell the select beef high enough without putting effort into it yep. there's never been an effort to to add value to it and i mean that's uh with what we do you know with our direct consumer market we never want to make a prime yeah prime right. is never prime is never on our goal because we never sell to a restaurant we don't sell to a high-end steakhouse we don't that's not our customer we want to we want to that's exactly why I asked that question. I mean, when we say better cattle, what do we necessarily mean? I mean, we're all just trying to make different cattle that we're able to make a profit on. We just, it's our job to find the market for them cattle, essentially. Yeah. Exactly, Dustin. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the people that are, the people that are bitching the loudest about about the prices and are scared to death from what this cap market is going to be in six months are the ones that put the least amount of effort into marketing their product. Exactly. I, I, I mean, plain, plain and simple. There's a lot of guys that, that they, Jesus, they bitch and yell and scream and set their hats on fire when you tell them they need to precondition their fucking calves. Yeah. And God, don't ever, don't ever, don't ever suggest some son of a bitch wean one and do some chores in the fall. <laughs> oh shit! Exactly. No tar and feathers and hang you from from the church people. If somebody will, well, damn it, we've shipped our calves every year. Yada yada. Well, yeah, don't don't ever take some responsibility and and precondition and wean that son of a bitch for forty five days and ship him direct to a yard and harvest some of that profit that the background gets in there. No shit, no, don't do that. Just sit on your ass and yell and scream about how unfair the system is because they won't do all your work for you. But Well, and, and, and to add to that point, I mean, my biggest friend right now is my iPad or my iPhone or my computer because I can sit in there and it doesn't, I mean, that's got a sharp pencil all the time. And you start looking at, and, he's, and you start telling these guys, well, if you'd wean your calves and precondition your calves for 45 days, it's going to cost you this much and it's going to add this much value. And well, that's not the way we've ever done it. And that just, it pisses me off because guys don't want to sit down and do the extra, the, the little bit of extra and, 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 and capture that. But yet, like you said, they're the ones that are bitching the loudest. I, I made the, I made the post a while back and, um, uh, there's people that are, are big on tradition, and boy, we've never done it the way, that way, never done it that way. And I'm, I made the comment, okay, when Grandpa was putting your shit together for you 60, 70 years ago, was he going out with a hand sigh and a pitchfork to put up hay, or was he running a sickle mower behind a tractor and a dump rake? Yep. So why, why sell your cattle the same way why get all tied up in these traditions from two, three, four, five generations ago when grandpa to stay in, to stay in business, grandpa figured out efficiencies and that's what grandpa did. You know, we had a lot of these ranches in the sand hills that were, uh, they, their, their whole management program was they calved late in the spring, didn't put up a lot of hay, made yearlings out of everything. And then the market went away from that. They thought they needed to run more cows. And, and you know, then it got to be, well, hell, we don't have to winter over these calves. We calve early. We don't have to winter over the calves or do this or do that. And, and now we're coming back, like Dusty, you said earlier, 
yeah, maybe we ought to go back to Kevin in May and June and, <laughs> and making life a little bit easier and making a year. You know, there's there's some of these things that, that guys need to look outside of their their comfort zone and and maybe I mean one of the one of the things that we do is is we put in embryos for other people. We just started doing it. Run part of our cow herd is strictly as recip cows. It's it's some work, it takes some management, but it's a considerable premium at a younger age than what the market is paying. And then obviously the market is paying it because nobody else wants to do it. Yeah. Nobody else, nobody else wants to do chores. Nobody mm -hmm. else wants to take a set of cows and run them through a shoot four or five times in a two week span. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, but, but boy, when you said, when you suggest harnessing value to other people, Oh boy, it just, and I guess I'm lucky they're that way because it leaves opportunities for the rest of us. That that's exactly right. I mean, there's tons and tons of opportunities to live this. I mean, to me, it's all about lifestyle. And, and there's tons of opportunities to live this lifestyle. You just might have to have your neighbors talking about you and, and realize that you need to be different to make it work. And, yep. and I'll even take what you said about grandpa going out and, and with his sycamore and take it one step farther. I mean, I kind of, I, I don't think I, I don't know if you'd call me a cowboy or, or a stockman or whatever. I don't care, but I'll take that one step further. When the cowboys were settling the West or, or actually the whole U S were they doing it with, with what they did back in England or back in Europe or whatever, or were they actually the cutting edge and, 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 you know, the, the tools that they used, I mean, a lot of that was, was new material and, and we're all about tradition. That's great. But, but we also need to, to value and harness the technology that's available and really look at some of these management decisions and some of these, uh, um, you know, some of these styles and go, well, what fits my area? What fits my lifestyle? What will work for me? Yeah. Dustin, barbed wire, barbed wire was the GPS of the 19th century. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, and it was as big a technological bleed. To yeah. go from herding cattle or daily, you know, daily taking care of, you know. Yeah, I, and, you know, there to was. To actually being able to fence stuff out of crops, actually being able to. They, they built fences out of stone in the old country, stone or split rails. Yeah. You know, so like I said, barbed wire was, was a pretty big technological advancement. <laughs> yeah. you know, there was uh quite a few people that died over barbed wire too uh you know and it was a fight. it was a fight because it broke tradition and uh and and i don't think we have any of those types of fights coming anytime soon but i like yeah you go back to like the johnson county war uh up in wyoming it was uh you know the the invention of barbed wire changed everything and uh there was a lot of cattle barons not real happy about it. Uh, there were some other ones that were there were plenty happy about it, um, but it was that unwillingness to adapt that uh, led to a lot of these like uh, banker-owned uh, ranches in the, you know, in the northern plains uh, as well. So it was kind of, you know, it, was, it wasn't so much that barbed wire well, was. All, all, oh, go ahead. I'll ask the question: How many? How many? cattle operations, if you go back through history, especially big ones, how often does a cattle operation actually get to become a cattle operation strictly from cattle? Very, <laughs> very little. Almost, I would bet you to say if you really looked at it, uh, you know, less than 10%, probably. I mean, and especially, I look around me, and I see the outfits that I know of that are that are powerful in the cattle business today that build it with cattle. They didn't do it with mama cows or a hay baler. They did it, they did it background in cattle, taking high risk cattle, doing a good job of feeding and keeping their costs low and sourcing out as much as they could 
on things that cost that were high high maintenance high cost yeah really good cattle feeding family here multi-generational cattle feeding family that started in eastern nebraska and moved west i mean they didn't adapt to steam flaking until just a few years ago they kept all their costs low and did all this they fed a lot of plain cattle and they fed some good cattle too but they fed a lot of cattle per man and they didn't own any ranches or own any cows until after the money had been made feeding cattle and feeding yeah. cattle for other people well, and, and, and that's what really, uh, it piques my interest because I had a guy tell me the other day, he said, you know, if, if, if keep an eye out. He said, a lot of the guys that you think and you consider successful, he said, they're the ones that are in trouble. So it really makes me think, it, it, what do we consider successful? Is it driving a pickup that's less than two or three years old? Is it driving the brand new John Deere tractor or Case tractor around in the field? what's successful i mean that whole paradigm may shift and probably should shift to well let's look at the guy that's actually been taking care of his land for 30 years and let's look at the guy that's doing a little something different like you john or 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 like i propose that i'm looking at doing or or my neighbor you know what is sustainability and what is profitability i mean yeah we got to make money yeah we got to feed our families but but Boy almighty, I, I just because my neighbor's driving a brand new pickup doesn't make it profitable. Yeah. When I, when I graduated from high school in 1994, I told my dad, I said, someday I had two, we had two neighbors. And one neighbor was running over a thousand head of black Angus mother cows as good of bitches as ever was. And another neighbor was farming about 5,000 acres of corn. And I told dad, I said, you know what? I said, my goal, I said, I want to run as many cows as Larry. And I want to farm as much ground as Kenny. And it wasn't five years and I had it done because both of them had went tits up. Yeah. Neither, neither guy's in business today. And I mean, it really plays to your point, Dustin. A lot of them guys, it really looks, it looks like it's really cool. It might not might not be going so good and, and we with the cost of land and the, and the equity tied up and expansion right now I looked at bringing two sons into the program one son has since left I, my youngest son is planning to, to stick and and have some big big ideas and when we're trying to help him with it but uh, my son turned four year at the end of the month he said if we could run enough cows to support three families why in the hell would we yeah why would we have why would we have two million dollars that we either have tied up in assets or be borrowing money again for just the cows or trying to make payments and pay rent on another five or six or ten million dollars worth of grass yeah why why if if just the three of us could make a living why why would we and so then that's that's why we started figuring well you know maybe maybe we need to figure out a way to make 500 dollars a head on our cows instead of being a commodity producer and breaking even eight out of ten years man that, that was our motivation and we're not we're not making that on all of our cows yet but but our goal is is within five to ten years is get to where we're we're, we're making a five hundred dollar profit per head on every every animal that leaves the place and and i i honestly i think if you're going to run a sustainable a financially sustainable operation that's probably the number that you need to have and you know if you're paying your own health insurance and trying to put some money aside for retirement like most businesses provide and get a decent return on your investment four or five hundred dollars a head is probably the profit level that you need to have to 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 provide those things for your family yeah you're probably and, right that that <laughs> i i've never heard a dollar amount put on that and that kind of uh 
boy, that hits the heartstrings a little bit. Well, yeah. I don't think I think you're right. Probably. Um, if you uh, right now in my neighborhood, I know of guys that are paying good hired men, and they're not they're not all stars, but they put in some hours. But a guy can go to work for somebody else if he's got three or four years of of experience, making fifty to sixty thousand dollars wages plus a thirty thousand dollar benefit package. You get to run some cows for free and use the boss's equipment, I mean and and houses and vehicles and and everything that all are an expense for for a person, for a family, but that the bosses are willing to, to so you know it's to to really be fair to yourself, <laughs> that, that, that's that's kind of where I where I arrive at the numbers that I do, and uh, and that's uh, Jake Jake and I's goal is to sell four hundred head of cattle a year that make five hundred dollars a head. Uh, by the like I said, by health insurance account, and you really get real with what you should be making for your time. That's probably kind of where you need to be, because I mean, my my son that's working in a in a manufacturing plant right now has a has a forty hour a week, forty to fifty hour a week job making about forty thousand. So it's it's kind of hard to tell him. Well, you know what? I think and some years you might get paid and. Most years you won't get a hell of a lot, and and you know what, kid? The last fifteen years you ain't gonna win fishing, but but maybe twice a year. So you know, really, you know how many Sundays you're gonna get off, and how many Saturdays you're gonna get loose. You know, that's what he said. He says, "Hell," he says, I, "Since I went to college, he says I've done more fishing and more hunting than I had total in the five years before that." Yeah. And so it, it it makes you question, you know. Every, we love this lifestyle, but it it uh, we can't expect people to keep making the same sacrifices that we've been willing to make. Well, and and I'll be honest with you, I'm in the boat that you just described. I mean, I I work for a for a fairly large and successful large operation, and and that's one of my wife's and I's biggest reservations about taking a step forward even if it's even if my computer says we can be profitable at it it's god that paycheck every two weeks boy that sure is nice yeah yeah you're you're right on that i'm kind of in the same boat i've uh i've been working at uh you know getting started at something myself but then you look well i got at least least grass am i gonna have to fix fence are they gonna have to fix fence are they are we splitting materials what it what is it and uh well next thing you know well yeah i I ain't making 500 bucks a head so well you uh well next year maybe uh maybe i can come at it with a you know a bigger run or but it's you know and i've had this conversation with myself for the last six eight years and and it always leads to all right. So what what do I have to do different to where I don't have to go? You know, it's you know it's it's cows. It's going to be hard work. We all we all know that the work part's going to be hard, and we know the pay part's going to be pretty small. But like how how do you how do you market yourself? How do you time it? How do you how do you do something different that everybody else isn't doing? to like you said to capture capture that extra value um and uh so one of the one of the things i've been kind of pounding the table for that that people not so much you got to change your entire operation to do it but take advantage of it is the direct uh, consumer marketing because it costs nothing to put a post out on facebook uh, if you've already got the internet, if you're, if you're buying internet just to do that, then it's probably not worth it. But if, if you already got internet, which about everybody does, you already got a smartphone, take a picture of one of your steers, 
make it, you know, have one of your kids make it look awesome. Put a, put a post up said, Hey, I've got beef for sale, whatever. You don't have to do your entire herd like that. That obviously probably not, not very feasible unless you uh, live very close to a, a large city and, and can, uh, and can find a niche market. But for a couple head here and there, depending on what, what you, uh, the market can handle, you can actually make a profit on some cattle. Maybe not make a, you know, a huge uh, dent in your overall deal, but it, it'll cut away a little bit of your cost. And um, this term sustainability has been thrown around a bunch. And you look at the outfits that have been around forever and ever, uh, you know, like the King Ranch or something like that. You know, one of the, like the old founding ranches of the West. You know, they're still around. They're still raising cattle. I, I'd say they're pretty sustainable. 100% chance they're not doing almost anything the same way they did when they started. So sustainability doesn't mean you have, there's a, you know, a one size fits all. Sustainability means you adapt to the climate you adapt to the market, you've got to, like, you've always got to change what you do, or at least uh, put a different spin on it to, to get the most bang for your buck. And um, I like, I, like we said earlier, I, I see a lot of bitching throughout the, the cattle industry. And, uh, and aside from government mandates, I don't see a whole lot of effort to change what's being done but you starting to see people uh on on social media start uh advertising their product and uh, i i've i've heard it from several people well i just i don't want to go hawking beef on facebook well why not uh i guess is my main question like we're all uh we're all u.s cattlemen cowboys whatever you know we raise beef i don't i don't own any cattle at the moment but uh, i plan on it and that's that'll be U.S. American beef. Um, why don't you want to market? Why don't you want to share it out to the world? Are you proud of your product or are you not? Uh, may I, I don't know. I, I've just I've heard that comment a bunch. They're like, well, I just, you know that I, I guess nobody likes a salesman, so they don't they don't want to go hawking their product. Well, put a fucking ad people in. people are cowards. People are cowards, Matt. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no, it's all right. Well, if you don't want to post but it, but it, something it, it, on social media, put a fucking ad in the Western Ag Reporter. You know, nobody has to see your face then. Uh, but but you'll, but, but like, you'll reach uh, first, you know, personally, people. Personally, it, it, it takes balls to sit there and cook a meal for, say, 500 people. Mm-hmm. And know that you're the guy that fed it. You lined up the processor. And then you're standing there. I mean, it's your ass on the line for every step of it. Yep. You're going to feed a four or 500 person wedding or making a hundred sandwiches for a town festival in an hour, you know, and some of those things. It, it's kind of, it can, it can rattle you if you don't, if you don't pay attention and don't, don't kind of categorize it that you're not going to be able to keep everybody happy, but your goal is to make as many people happy as you can. Mm-hmm. And we have a tremendous amount of people that are in the cow business that have no idea what the other segments, what level of work that is and how much, honestly, how much courage it takes to sit there and say, God damn, I hope this calf is as good as we think he is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's, uh, you know, and again, it gets back to that entitlement deal everybody you know well i don't want to do this well son of a bitch there's a whole lot of jobs out there in the world where people don't get to pick what they want to do when people say that well i don't want to hawk beef i don't want to have to do this i don't want to have to do that i know i didn't really want to spend several years in the oil fields but it's what i did to get to where i'm at now yeah <laughs> i mean that's uh yeah people kind of if you want to get through tough times, they kind of are going to have to get tough. And that yeah, it's, uh, I mean, ways for made, but it, uh, if I want to be able to stay here and still be in the cattle business, I, I can't sit here and do the same things as everybody else. You no. Know, complaining, complaining 
I, I'd be curious, and, and, and this is maybe a little bit of a rabbit trail, John, but but it sounds like you have a pretty clear path of where you're going and where you want to be. It, it is something my wife and I are, are working on, but uh, how many producers out there actually set, say, 5, 10, 15, 20, and when you're setting on your deathbed the day before you die, how many people set goals for that time of their life? and actually measure them goals and go back and say, you know, we weren't successful at this, but uh, it's because of this and we need to change this to get back on that path. Yeah, Dustin, that brings up a good point. One of the, um, before I got into Facebook and everything, I, I did a lot of, a lot of reading. I read every night. Um, I'd take a book with me. I haul a lot of water to my cows in the wintertime. And I would take a book with me. And while I was dumping water, I'd read four or five pages out of a book. When I, when I was hauling corn in the fall, I'd read four or five pages out of the book. One of my favorite books was The Age of Turbulence by Alan Greenspan. And in, in that book, Alan goes through a lot of the history and, and talks about conservative-minded and capitalism and everything. And one of the biggest tenets I took from that book was the term creative destruction. Yeah. Operations that survive in any business, when technology starts to change, when the business model starts to change, they start pulling resources away from the antiquated business and moving it towards other businesses that are more profitable and more cutting edge technology. You Prime see. example is Texas Instruments calculators. 40 years ago, Texas Instruments was cutting edge. They never changed. Everybody else was getting into making laptops and they were still making pocket calculators. I, I mean, that's just a, and so creative destruction and nobody, I learned it firsthand in the oil fields. When a field was no longer profitable, you plugged that bastard out, you loaded the units and you went someplace where it was. You took every available resource you could and moved it away. Yeah. Cow people don't do, cow people don't do that. I mean, Plain and, plain and simple, look at, look at how many people run the same kind of cattle that Grandpa ran. Yep, yep. I mean, it, it, there, I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of things in this world that, you know, and I wonder how many grandpas would come back from the grave and wring the necks of their their kids or their grandkids, you know, because. And it's, uh, I've got a good friend that has made the comment several times. There's too many people in the cattle business that have absolutely no interest in being profit. How, how, many, how many grandpas, if they looked at being able to sell the ranches for the ranches in relationship to their ability to raise, to feed a family, how many grandpas would sell that son of a bitch in a heartbeat? I mean, in all honesty, how many of them guys that busted their ass to make a living and put something together, they did it when it, when it was economically feasible, when land would kind of pay, and they didn't have a lot of depreciation, they didn't have to have much equipment, and they'd be saying, huh, we could sell this ranch today, and we'd be set for two or three generations and everybody could have nice jobs. Hell, we never really wanted to do nothing but team rope and be cool anyhow, but we had to have cows to pay the bills. I mean, I, I, I honestly, I wonder how many of them old boys would say, you know, this should probably be hard. I mean, we, we had an opportunity to sell a little bit of ground for development purposes. And my dad and I had this discussion close to 30 years ago. I was going to school and he said, boy, I said, I hate to sell that ground. I said, what the hell would Ott do? I said, what would Uncle Ott do if he had that opportunity? Well, shit, he'd sell it. 
Said he had an opportunity. He paid for this whole son of a bitch. When the market went up, he sold a quarter off of this place and got more out of the quarter than he gave for the whole 400 acres five years before. Huh. That's it. So I said, that ought to tell you what kind of business decision a guy ought to make once in a while, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it's uh that's one of those those tough deals when it's uh you know when you're fifth sixth generation and uh I guess I don't know how much uh the population boom is in uh South Dakota or Nebraska but like uh my home state Colorado you know the the city just keeps you know inching outwards so Anytime a guy sells a quarter of land to a developer, you know, you're getting a whole bunch of fucking Californians moving in. And, uh, and it's kind of, now I'm here in Nevada. It's kind of the same way, but you know, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's always the people that are still around, um, you know, and, and still doing well, like they, they don't do the same thing, you know, everything the same, you know, it's, Tradition is important. I I believe the the traditional lifestyle that we live out here is is important, you know. But you don't have to be as traditional in your business practices. You know, there's 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 certain tried and true time tested methods of handling cattle, um, of the way you, way you do stuff that that just works. It's been proven over and over. Uh, maybe there'll be some improvement on it in the future, but for right now, like, you know low stress works it works and uh oh, hold and, on can i can i interrupt? can i interrupt you for just a second yeah go ahead uh, i i'm curious on the on the low stress thing and uh you know the the bud box type uh revolution that seems to be going on the last five to ten years when i grew up i mean and I'm 33 years old, so I'm not I'm not real old. But when I grew up there, you couldn't have enough hot shots around when you were working cattle and enough people hooting and hollering and screaming and and dogs barking and and, and I mean something as simple as that is is changing and it's going back to a really a simpler way of doing things where slower is a lot of times faster. Yeah. Yeah, and well, I, I don't know. It's there. There's certain, uh, and, and I, I always have to. I've made the point several times that low stress does not mean no stress at all, and that's that's where a lot of people get uh, hung up. And so, uh, say like if if you have to uh, chase this calf around the pen for 20 minutes to try to get him out, just because he just you know. You know those those wily little bastards. You know they'll they'll head fake, head fake, head fake, and and you know you could be on Doc Alina himself and uh, and and just get roasted. Uh, so instead of chasing him around the pen for twenty minutes, try him to the gate a couple times. If he keeps blowing by you, slap a loop on the bastard, drag him out, and and you saved fifteen minutes of your time and fifteen minutes of chasing the little bastard around. Was it stressful? Fuck yeah, it was. Was it as as stressful as taking him out the gate under his own will? Probably not. So the low stress method in that in that scenario is to rope him around his damn neck and yank his ass out of the pen. Um. So I and and maybe uh maybe I'll get some flack for that. Probably not. It's it's a cowboy page, so uh cowboy podcast. So uh if I get any flack, they can make it buck right off but i laugh about it because we uh, every cow on our place takes at least two trailer rides a year and some of them takes three or four depending on their age but uh every cow gets hauled two corn stalks and hauled away from corn stalks and a lot of times they might have to get hauled between two sets of corn stalks mm. and they'll also maybe get to stop off the home place before they go to the ranch if they're if they're really young or if they're really old, you know, or if they've got any kind of an issue, they'll stop off where we can watch them close instead of just going to the ranch and get kicked out. And so we sit there and we we gather cows with portable corrals, and our drift fences are single wire hotlines, 
I will set up 12 portable corrals in a, in a corner and gather cows. And we'll drive by people that have the wheel corrals and four neighbors and six horses and a and couple of quads. And, and we'll, I'll just sit there and I'll do, do stuff by myself. Usually my youngest will get there after school and help me. And I've had guys more than once, I'd have four or five cows that, that wouldn't go in. And I'd be down to, I'd have eight or 10 in the pen, I'd have four or five cows that had been bitches and wouldn't go in. And so I'd open up the gates and let them eight or 10 out that I had already caught. Somebody said, well, geez, why, 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 are you, why are you letting those cows out? Fuck, I caught them once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, this continent's surrounded by water. Where are they going to go? I can get them. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you know, it's it's amazing how people get caught in a, in a certain paradigm, you know, and, and we laugh about it. there's lots of times we can't get a cow to load and somebody else will go off the trailer and come back on and then she'll load. Yep. You yep. know, and, and people are that same way. They'll get they'll get hung up and they'll refuse to do something, refuse to do something until somebody else comes back and picks them up and takes them along with them. You yeah. Know, they've got to have They'll refuse, they'll refuse, they'll refuse until somebody's been to the other side and come back and says, shit, man, I didn't die. <laughs> you know, we, can, <laughs> we can do this. Yeah, well, uh, and, you know, and you, you might completely miss your mark, but find something pretty cool along the way. I mean, Christopher Columbus was looking for fucking India. <laughs> and uh, he found this great, <laughs> great nation, so. Yeah, yeah, we have. We have a running joke at our place that uh, for years, at one time we had, uh, when I was in the oil fields, we had 80 head of Holstein bottle calves on feet at a time. My boys were real little. What got us into the Holstein business is we had a dairy stiff us for a bunch of hay, and the only way we could get paid was taking Holstein bull calves for several months. And so to get our hay money, we took all these Holstein bull kids and figured out how we can kind of make a little money at it. Well, then the running joke was by the time Jake was about 10 or 11 years old, we'd quit running any Holsteins. And Jake says, God, he said, I hope we're never so broke that we got to feed Holsteins again. <laughs> okay, now we come down. Jake turned 16 here a year ago. And he starts buying Holsteins to feed for his catering business. I said, Jake. I said, I said, we're right back where you started. Yeah, Dad, these are a little different Holsteins, though. But it's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, a little yeah. different <laughs> describes every single Holstein ever conceived and, and every future Holstein that to be conceived. They're, they're a little, little different. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. You can't. You know, you've got to put harness, harness snaps on all the chains on the gates. Oh yeah, yeah. I I they love they love to lift the gates open and. Oh man, I I saw one. Uh, like I don't. I'm not sure exactly how we accomplished it, but we found him. Uh, we found him dead. Up against the gate with the chain down his throat. And, uh, but there, there was nothing for him to hang on. So like, I don't know how he, he, I guess hung himself. I, I don't really know exactly what the, like we never did cut him up. We just called him a, a mechanical or accidental or something like that. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't do a, a full necropsy, but like, I don't know how you hang yourself when like, there's nothing constricting. <laughs> I mean, it was just the chain down his neck. And but he was dead, deader in a doornail. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck it was, but uh, all I can say was just uh, that that would never happen to a, any other breed of any animal, but but a Holstein cow. <laughs> I mean that that's the yep. only breed of animal it could ever happen to. <coughs> Goofy bastards. But oh well, fellas, it was a it was a good good chat tonight i i enjoyed it it was uh i i didn't i i spoke way less than i normally do but you guys uh you guys had a lot of good shit to say and i you know it was uh it's refreshing hearing something different besides uh just you know blaming the packer for our problems and i've 
almost started to sound like a Packer apologist here lately. Cause, but my, my big point is like, I can't leave the, you've been fighting with the Packer forever. That fight is going to continue forever. Uh, so look, look at your own operation, figure out what you can do different. And, uh, you know, and the chips will fall where they lay, but you know, you can always fight to, uh, like, you know, Thomas Massey introduced the Prime Act, which would uh, relieve regulations on these small and local regional uh, processors. And um, and so when, when you have this big cattle backlog that uh, they can't get to the, the big plants because they're shut down and through through other regulations and whatnot, you you lift the the red tape from these smaller guys. They can they can pick up some of that burden. And you know what? They're probably going to bid cash. They're they're, they're probably not going to be buying on a formula contract. So that's gonna that's gonna open up some competition into the market. And the more people that start selling a little bit direct, you know that helps the local processor. They they may be able to hire a, a, another guy or two. You know that helps like the local electrician, the local sheet metal guy, whatever. You know. Uh, it adds a lot to the local economy. And it adds to your consumption. Yeah. Yeah, it does. You're, it's, amazing, it's amazing how much more beef people eat when it's in the freezer. Mm -hmm. Well, I, when yeah, the, it's, it's exactly when the, right. When the, housewife goes, when the housewife goes to Walmart, she's looking for what she's going to have with the hamburger or with the roast or with the steaks. Yeah. The beef, the beef is not competing with the chicken breasts or the pork chops. No, because those, it's those, already there. Those, yeah, they they become a well health. Yeah. Until they until they're on their fourth night in a row of beef, mm -hmm. they don't consider the other proteins when they've got the beef at home. Yeah, people you know, like they, it. They, 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 they they look for they look for something to to break the monotony. I mean, I can track a lot of my families are eating at least double of what per capita consumption is just from the simple fact of what I'm selling. Them. Well, I mean, and per capita consumption, 50 some pounds and I'm selling these people per person in the household. I'm selling them 115, 120 pounds of beef a year. Oh person. yeah. Hell and I yeah. know that they're eating a cheeseburger someplace else once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people like it, beef. Yeah. It, oh, I was just going to say that because it's funny. I mean, we, we raise what our beef that we eat, and and we also raise our pork that we eat and we raise chickens that we eat too and and eggs and things like that you know what we're always out of it it's not the pork or the chickens it's it's the dang gum beef yep. and them apples are a heck of a lot bigger when you go to butcher them there's a lot more pounds of beef there and we're yep. always wondering well what can we use this pork for or what can we use this chicken for but exactly it, it's never a concern for the beef <laughs> And it's, and it's fun to watch families evolve. Yeah. You know, when, the, when the kids are little, they run out of hamburger first. Mm. <laughs> when the when the when the kids are when the kids are gone, they run out of steaks first. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, and you know, it's uh the selling direct deal too. Like I said, and I have to always reiterate, you don't have to change your entire operation to do this, but you can hold back a steer or two you know, uh, Cole, Cole Heifer, whatever, feed them out, sell it, uh, however you want to sell it, market it, however the fuck you want to. But, uh, when you, when you got this like demand USA beef deal, that sounds really good. You're going to get a lot of signatures at the end of the day. When people are in the grocery store, they're probably going to pick the, the lower price one. If they, if they don't, if they're not a, like a meat connoisseur, they're probably going to go with the lower priced one probably going to be some imported beef uh whatever but uh, so it's it's kind of like the buy usa uh tool stuff everybody says buy american buy american still buying a lot of fucking chinese products you know what because they're cheaper they're cheaper uh and that's that's what matters at the end of the day but when they can put a face to the buy american beef you got a leg up tell a story yep. That's what that's what social media is there for. Tell your story, and uh, it doesn't matter if you think it's corny or cheesy, and you're a little uh, worried about it. People eat that shit up, and uh, and well, it's 
it's just uh it's it's another avenue you can go down and it may not be profitable at first but you can build into something and um Every, know. everybody knows what coca-cola is there's yep. nobody on the planet that doesn't know what coca-cola is but they still advertise this shit every day yes sir yes sir if you've got to be top of mind you've got to be in the game and and back to your comment about everybody wants american the people that are willing to pay for it are going to find it or yep. they are already found it. Yeah, exactly your grocery, right. Your grocery, store, your grocery store shopper doesn't give a fat rat's ass. No, no, they really don't. Exactly right on your point about price. Yeah. When they're, when they're walking through the grocery aisle, price is their first determinating factor. Mm. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I'm all for U.S. beef. I'm in. I'm in the U.S. cattle business. I, I want. I want our ranchers to do well. I want our feeders to do well. And you know what? Hell, it's America. I want our packers to do well. I wish they weren't Brazilian owned, but you know that's that's a topic for another time. Uh, that's that's a, just a whole another can of worms. But I still, you know, there's a ever just about all of those people working there, uh, allegedly are American. So uh, I want them to do well too. Uh, I, I just don't know if all these government mandates, I, I, I say I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure they don't, uh, or they're not going to fix our problems. Uh, the, the problem solving starts with uh, the individual producer. It always comes down to an individual level uh, whether it's government or, or, it, or the cattle business, whatever, one size don't fit all. You gotta, you gotta adapt and what, make it work for you. And that was, that was one of the big, uh, things that set Bud Williams apart from Temple Grandin and why a lot of cattlemen prefer the Bud Williams method is because he took what you had made a few slight modifications and your cattle flowed better. Temple Grandin built a whole new damn thing. Which it works fine. It works great. Cost a lot of money. Bud Williams would say, all right, block that hole, do something here. Next thing you know, cattle are flowing just fine. Uh, it didn't cost you an arm and a leg. It, uh, you had to look at it a little bit different. And uh, I, think, I think that's one thing we're lacking sorely in the cattle business. I Hopefully it changes, but may, I think conversations like this helps. Um, whether, you know, we don't have a whole lot of people watching, but we've got a few people watching. And I'm sure a few of those people don't agree with everything we said, but I bet something sticks. So I don't know. <coughs> Making the I, world. I up. do have a question if you got a little time. <coughs> Go for it. This, this would be directed towards John. Is I'm curious when you're direct marketing these animals to your consumers, how are you selling them? And the reason I ask is, is where we're at here, we're four and a half hours away from the closest USDA inspected plant. And one of the biggest concerns and complaints that we hear from people, like when we do our hogs, is, is well, we don't want to buy a half or we don't want to buy a whole. We want to be able to buy 10 pounds of sausage and, and some pork chops. And, and on a beef, you know, that's a lot bigger. How, how do you do that? Or, or are you going to a USDA inspected plant? I, I am spoiled. I am eight miles from my, from my feedlot to a USDA inspected plant. It's, it's, eight, it's eight miles, 10 minutes. Um, and, and that's, uh, we're really spoiled. We've got uh, 10,000 people population in my home county. About 85% of the beef that we raise and sell direct stays in our home county. Uh, used to be the smallest quantity I would sell was a half a beef, but with uh, the way things have changed and with the opportunity to get more customers, we've went to one eighth. The smallest quantity we will sell is a one eighth bundle. Um, we will we divide so many beef a month into one eighth bundles, and uh, we get a premium for that product because we have more labor tied up in it. Yeah, and it, um, but it allows like retired couples that only need to. It gets it into a small enough quantity to where they can get almost all of in their freezer, 
on their refrigerator, leave a few packages thawed out that they could consume in a few days. Um, so it isn't a big burden that way. And then you've got some families that'll buy four bundles a year, and then you can convince them that they need to be buying a half a beef at a time. And then they'll be buying a full beef at a time and saving a little money. And then some of the, our older couples that uh, no longer have the kids home, you know, two bundles a year probably gets them by. And so that's, that's how we're doing that. I, uh, I've got friends and neighbors that sell by the package and I refuse to do that just for the simple fact I don't have time to dick around with 10 pounds. I, I've sold, I've had some people that have bought like 40 and 50 pounds of hamburger at a time and we'll do that out of the catering business stash if we're starting to get a backlog of a certain cut. But, uh, but I just don't have the time. If we're going to, if we're going to do something for 20 or $30 at a time, we're going to set up our food trailer. We can sell more pounds in a day through that food trailer prepared at a high markup than what we can sell it out of the pool in the back of our pickup. And so it's, <laughs> that, that kind of sounds terrible, but I want other people to, I need a certain level of commitment. If my, if my customer isn't willing to commit $300 to me, it's not worth my time. Well, yeah, it, it is what it is. That, 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 that sounds rude, but, but at the end of the day, it's got to be worth my time. And if they can't buy $300 worth of product at a time, it's, it's, there's not enough meat on the bone. As close to my margin is there's not enough meat on the bone for me to mess with it. Well, that just goes back to uh, what uh, Dustin was saying earlier is, um, you know, it's it's not so much that you're doing a worse job; you're doing a better job for your your outfit. It makes more sense. So, it's it's just business. You know, you it's one of the, like I said, you have to figure out what what works. Where where what's your cutoff point? What's whatever? When 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 are you going to either start losing money or is it uh is is it offset by the extra labor? It's uh. You know, it's yeah, and we it's a business decision, and we, and you we know, stay- that's where, as Americans, we've got so so wussified by we get offended by everything. Where I mean, a business decision is a business decision. It doesn't mean we can't be still be friends. Yeah, right, right. And you know, it's uh, I think our system's working because we stay so we stay sold out four to five months in advance. Well. Doing something right. Yeah, we have all, all of our inventory. Uh, we've got uh, 40, I think 43 or 44 head booked between now and the first of the year. And uh, I think we've got seven head that aren't sold that will go in in November and December. And so it's all, it's all pre-sold, pre-spoken for, and and I haven't started calling back repeat customers that normally get beef in that time frame. I would I would doubt if I'll have any beef available the rest of the year by the first of June. And and just so I'm clear on this, and of course I hope you'll sense my sarcastic in this, but this is something that you walked into that was already set up and it was easy for you to do, right? Oh, streamlined oh, process. Yeah. Streamlined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 custom, custom job right off the yeah, right we that. started out we started out doing this with hogs we started out doing this with hogs in the late 90s and when we raised a hog I had a guy come to me he owed me $120 for a big fat hog and I caught up to him he owed me for six months and he gave me the check and he says oh and I'd like to order another one I said well we're no longer doing that we're no longer raising hogs <laughs> He said, well, son of a bitch, where am I going to get my hogs now? I said, I don't know. I said, does Walmart let you carry them for, you know, do they carry you for six months? <laughs> no. I said, well, I said, that's part of the reason why we're no longer doing this. I yeah. said, so I got pretty cynical. I, I paid a lot of tuition <laughs> as far yeah. as learning how to, yeah. you know, and, I, and that's, that's part of the reason why we do it the way we do it. But yeah, it's, uh, it's taken a lot of, a lot of work and, and, little bits of time here and there we work at it every day not all day but 
you know, well, but, feed mixing and and things like that. We can we can put out a beef post and and do a little advertising and and uh, and just keep building it. But but that's a problem. Uh, I guess you know. You said you've been working on this since the mid to late nineties. I mean, that's twenty years ago or more. Yep. And my generation is now. You know, we're in our or early 30s and that's a problem that I see with my generation and I'm just as bad as as everybody else I want it now yeah I, I don't want to yeah I don't want to work for it I don't want to wait for it I want it now and and it's Dustin to, to, to be fair to myself we sold 10 or 12 a year for probably 15 years and the last four or five years we've got serious about it and we went to we went to twenty a year and then thirty a year and forty and and we'll do probably sixty in this calendar year and and I think it'll just keep growing, but we didn't <clears throat> for years it was it was fun money yep. we'd sell we'd sell ten or twelve beef a year and 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 it was uh, it wasn't a focus because we were selling seven or 800 had a fat cattle a year. Yeah. And so we, we kind of poo pooed it. Oh, this is the, the ones that are too light or the ones that get done a little, we got a shorty on this load. Let's, let's go ahead and that little short light carcass heifer. Let's go ahead. We'll just, uh, we'll sell her. We'll pull her off and we'll, we'll eat her. Oh, hell that big Holstein steer. He was cheap. We'll just put him in and we'll sell him as a locker beef, you know, and we just kind of, it was kind of the fun money deal. Well, then after we got our ass handed to us feeding, you know, feeding a lot of cattle, I said, well, hell, I can still feed cattle and I can sell them this way. And, you know, instead of selling a load that makes 20 bucks a head, we sell one that makes four or 500. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. so that was, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we've been playing at this a long time, but, but we haven't gotten serious until the last few years, you know. You know, and that goes back to what I said before about our goals and things like that. And, and you know, I said I want this now or I want that now, and, and I do. But it, but I also have goals of what what five years from now should look like and what ten years from now should look like. And I really think if, if people in general and ranchers especially would sit down and say, you know, what what are we doing this for? our industry would change for the better overnight. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, and, and, you know, for, for all like the new genetics and, uh, the, the new technology, the new drugs and everything, <clears throat> the, like the, the day to day stuff in the, in the cattle business has changed very little. And, uh, whether it be marketing, whether, you know, what whatever you know it's it's just well we've done it this way forever and this is how it always is and well now now the the market sucks and uh you can't even afford to uh to raise the animal that you're trying to sell so what well, what can you do different that's uh, that's always the, the issue and and change is always you know people people are scared to change um i, I don't know it's just uh we, I guess the, the, the worst part of it is, uh, you know, show me 10 cattlemen and I'll show you nine stubborn assholes and, uh, and one guy that's just not quite as much of an asshole, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, that, that, that might be the, the biggest issue of it is just, you got a bunch of stubborn assholes <laughs> that refuse to change. And, uh, and, you know, <laughs> Obviously, it's a uh, it's a joke where I'm, uh, you know, we're all, we're all cattlemen here, and I think that uh, I think everybody can kind of uh, get on board with that statement. Uh, it's nothing personal to anyone. It's just as a as a whole, it it takes kind of takes a stubborn asshole to want to deal with a, you know, a, just a shit ass little calf that uh, wants to grow up into something that wants to stomp a hole in your guts eventually you know it's uh it takes a different personality but uh sometimes that personality is a detriment to us and uh i don't know it's uh it's a it's a weird time we're living in uh i i'm i'm curious to see who comes out 
ahead in the long run, but I think it's going to be people that are uh, willing to take a little risk. <clears throat> you know, you, you talked about the risk management part of it and yeah, uh, anything worthwhile, it's going to take a little bit of risk at least, uh, if not a whole bunch. So I don't know if you're, if you're not willing to change, you're probably, probably going to go under. I, you know, if you're, if you're getting your ass kicked and you're not willing to do something different, well, it's, uh, you can, you might still get your ass whipped, but you can at least fight back a little bit. So I don't know. It's, uh, well, the way, the way I look at it, you know, everybody thinks wolves are cool. You know, everybody outside agriculture, you know, that's always talking about a wolf pack and boy, how cool are wolves. And they're kind of neat. They're pretty and all that good shit. But you know what? Coyotes adapt and they're everywhere. Oh, yeah. Wolves, wolves, wolves are maybe 10, 12 states, but coyotes are everywhere. Yeah. And a coyote, he, he don't care if he eats a Big Mac out of a dumpster or if he eats a roadkill rabbit, but he adapts and he survives. Yeah. You know, he's more worried about surviving than looking cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. And sometimes, and sometimes people kind of got to remember that a little bit, you know. Well, and uh, yeah, and just, you know, any any big change is going to be met with a ton of resistance. You know, was it uh, was it Galileo that said the earth was round and he got excommunicated from the church? So it's, uh, <laughs> tur turns out he was right. And well, unless you uh, subscribe to the flat earth theory, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take a deep dive down the rabbit hole of uh, flat earth one of these days to, to, to see what it's all about. But uh, anyhow, you know, just a simple statement like that gets you kicked out of the church, uh, which was kind of a big deal back in those days. So any, any sort of radical change is going to be met with a lot of resistance. So I don't know who knows if we're right. Uh, I don't think we're wrong I and mean, we may not be all, all right, but I think, uh, I think it's good. To, it's good to hear some people asking some different questions and uh, offering some different viewpoints. So um, I had a lot of fun on this one, guys. It was, it was a good, good bullshit session i enjoyed it thanks for coming on um if you guys got anywhere you want people to find you on social media go ahead and and, and plug whatever uh just uh just reach out to me uh john o'day uh, the way it's got it spelled here that's my son's name on uh, on facebook uh, spell mine without the apostrophe and with a small d um my uh my kid always likes to give me shit about that. That the way they can tell us apart is you got the, uh, the young one that's got the big D. So. <laughs> I was. Uh, I'm glad you. I'm glad you said that. I was gonna. I was gonna make that joke anyways, and hopefully you didn't take it the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had we've had a lot of fun with that. In fact, the boys, we've got uh, one of my favorite stories like that is uh, they got a. We bought a one-ton Dodge pickup with a Hemi in it. And, of course, high school kids are high school kids, and they were giving them shit. They said, well, God, that's a waste getting a big old one-ton Mopar and not getting a Cummins, you know, and yada, yada, yada. Well, the boys just started calling that pickup then Big Dick. <laughs> and and a couple, one of their teachers one day, because G and Jake were in a class together, and they said, G said, where's, where's this at? And he said, oh, I said, I left it out there in Big Dick. <laughs> what do you call that pickup big dick he said, oh, I said you got a big dick you don't need a Cummins to be cool that's kind of stuck so. I, I like it uh, that's funny alright so John O'Day on Facebook how about you Dustin or are you, are you cool just uh, not, not oh, letting anybody I, know where you're at well, I well, you can look me up on Facebook. It's Dustin Burgraff, and I don't really post a whole lot in there. Um, I mean, we're up here in North Central South Dakota, just ranching away, living the dream, um, do custom leather work and chinks, chaps, bags, whatever, whatever else. I mean, just stuff to try and make this lifestyle keep plugging away, I guess. Every little bit helps. Right on. Well, go look him up, order some leather shit. Well, uh, I think that that's probably going to do it for us. Uh, everybody out there watching, we still got a couple people 
tuning in. But uh, I, once again, I appreciate y'all coming on. And um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, you know where to find me. And uh, we'll, we'll be back here uh, Thursday. So uh, thanks, guys. And uh, move your ass. We're burning daylight. All right. Thanks, All man. right. You bet. Hey, thanks again. We're off air, but uh, I appreciate everything. It was an excellent conversation. I had a, had a good time. Uh, we'll have you back on soon. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for doing it. You bet. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. We'll see you guys. Yep.